to people around the world, the memory remains vivid, and time has not eased the intense emotions stirred up by the name of the killer, Mark David Chapman. It was such a senseless murder, profound in its impact and so painful even today. It makes it very hard to understand why Chapman, who claimed to be a devoted fan, would have gunned down a man he didn't know, a man who had never done him harm. This is the first time Mark David Chapman has done a television interview. He lives in an isolated section of Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York. And it was there that I met him. It is an interview that will still cause upset, I believe, to a great many people. But we hope it will add to an understanding of why this hideous crime was committed. John, so John Lennon. Lennon. Man, he was a fair white, a white man. He was big, and he was arguing with the, with the doorman. And then all of a sudden, he heard five, six shots, and that was it. Finally, they were loud, too. Four cops pulled John Lennon out and put him into the back of the police car. Uh, he was shot by an unknown at this time, white male, who was in custody at this time. Mr. Lennon died as a result of multiple gunshot wounds of the chest and left shoulder. He was struck by four bullets. December 8, 1980. A shocking, confusing time. The unforgettable night John Lennon was murdered. His assassin, Mark David Chapman. Why did you kill John Lennon? John Lennon fell into a very deep hole. A hole that was so deep inside of me that I thought by killing him, I would acquire his fame. It was his lifelong dream to be famous. Surely Mark David Chapman, a chronic nobody, was in the thoughts of many of the 100,000 people who gathered in Central Park to mourn John Lennon. Chapman's arrest made news around the globe. He was one of the most hated men in the world. I liked John Lennon at one point myself. Before this thought of murder came inside myself, I would be very angry at anybody who did anything to him. So I can understand their anger. It's very difficult being who I am. I have to face what I've done every day. That's not easy. And I imagine this will go on until I die. This is the historic DeCulter Apartment Building in New York. Here in the beauty of Central Park, it's hard to imagine the senseless murder that was committed just across this lake, in front of the DeCulter Apartments where John and Yoko lived. It seems such a demented act that by anyone's standards, Mark David Chapman had to be insane. Yet Chapman himself rejected the insanity defense and pled guilty. Because he never stood trial, the world was left wondering what went on in the mind of Mark David Chapman. Why on earth did he do it? Was he insane? Is he sane today? When I met him recently, he certainly seemed to be. I can face it now. I can look at what I did from a rational perspective, from, an, from even another perspective of you know, kind of placing myself back at that time and, and, and trying to analyze what I did, which I'm still undergoing, you know. Writer Jack Jones met Chapman six years ago at Attica Prison in upstate New York. After two years of extensive interviews, he's just published this book about Chapman's life called Let Me Take You Down. Here is Chapman, who was so disturbed and now doesn't seem disturbed. Why do you think that is? I think that... Uh during the past two years, we've done a lot of talking, and he's talked a lot of things out in the process of uh, <clears throat> providing me with information for this book and indicated that our relationship had sort of brought him a little closer to reality, perhaps. It was the early 60s when the Beatles' popularity exploded in America. Mark's family lived in Decatur, Georgia where his father gave Mark his first rock and roll album, Meet the Beatles. 
Like millions of fans in America, nine-year-old Mark immediately fell under the spell of Beatlemania and would be influenced dramatically by their music until he was an adult. I remember I had little army men and I pasted guitars on three of them and, and a drum set on, on one of them that hopefully looked like Ringo in the back and would play that record over and over just hundreds of times, you know, through the, through the months and years. Mark had a strong Christian upbringing, but he was also a lonely child who would often escape into a world of imaginary people. There was a whole city of them, and they kind of lived in the walls. They were almost microscopic. And dozens and dozens of people. Well, a whole city full of people. Hundreds of thousands. So here were these hundreds of thousands of people, and what were you to them? I was their king. King Mark's imaginary world was the only way he could cope with the violent reality of an abusive father. We had some sporadic uh, violence in the home. Your father doing my things father to your mother. Would strike my mother, and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in the middle of the night, I would I would hear this, and I would run in there and uh, try to break it up. Dr. Richard Bloom was one of six psychologists who examined Chapman in jail soon after the murder. He, he talked about. Uh, himself being abused, hit with a belt, and his mother being abused. I felt that I almost had to be an emotional, a guardian for my mother. He attempted throughout his life to cope with his own personal tragedy, trauma, uh, which happens, I, I believe, relates to the relationship with his father. When Mark was 14, the Beatles released a magical mystery tour, an album filled with drug-inspired imagery. Mark eagerly entered the world of LSD. But by his late teens in 1970, Mark thought he had found a direction for his life, working with refugees as a YMCA camp counselor in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Everyone liked this Mark Chapman. The people you worked with thought you were terrific, you like kids? Love them. In 1975, that YMCA refugee camp closed down, and Mark decided to enter Covenant College, a strict Christian school in Tennessee. College life didn't last long. Do you know why now? What happened? I could never figure it out. I mean, I had a major depression. He went from being big man in camp to a nobody on campus. I was an area coordinator. I was in charge of a staff of 15 people. When I got to school, I felt... Uh, like a nobody. The same kind of nobody you were as a little kid. Very good. I end up feeling, feeling like a big nobody. And that caused the depression. But the depression took over Mark's life. He dropped out of college and bought a one-way ticket to Hawaii. You went to Hawaii? Why? To kill myself. I drove to the north shore of the island. I found a supposedly a deserted spot. I had bought at Sears a little cheap plastic uh, vacuum cleaner hose. I hooked it up into the exhaust and I sat in the car and I turned it on and I just said, uh, you know, here I come. And, and I felt very much at peace. I really did. I felt at peace when I made that decision. But you were discovered and you were saved. Yes. After a few weeks in the hospital, Mark recovered enough to get a job. And then he met a travel agent named Gloria. First time you've smiled since we began this interview. Tell me about Gloria, the woman you later married. She's my gemstone. Gloria is five years older than you. Yes. She is of Japanese descent. Yes, she is. Yoko Ono is Japanese and was older than John Lennon. Yes. Gloria and Mark were married in 1979. She asked to have her identity concealed to discourage reprisals. Gloria watched the seemingly warm, loving man she married transform into a violent, unpredictable stranger. He would, um, once in a while, you know, hit me or grab me hard, right. um, or slap me. I'd have to say, though, in all fairness, um, he always gave me warning. When I would get very frustrated, I would, I would hit her. 
You did what your father did. Yes, I did. Were you a violent man then? At that point? Mm -hmm. Not outwardly. My, my little trick was always holding everything in, as my father did. And then it would just come out explosively. There was no way... Like many young people in their early 20s, Mark seemed to be struggling to find himself. He drifted from job to job and was moody and unpredictable. Deep down inside, though, he was losing his hold on reality. At the same time that all of this is happening, you're reading a book that many of us read. And, I, you know, I have a few of the things here that affected your life. Here's the paperback, The Catcher in the Ride by J.D. Salinger. Story of a teenager who feels... Well, you tell me what, what The Catcher in the Rye is about. The Catcher in the Rye is about a young fellow named Holden Caulfield who leaves school on a three-day journey through various parts of Manhattan, in a sense, to find himself. And he doesn't find anything but a bunch of phoniness, and he's telling the book in retrospect from a mental hospital. You identified with Holden Caulfield. I did at that time in my life when I had no identity. So Mark Chapman assumed the identity of the fictional teenager Holden Caulfield, and Mark became a believer in Caulfield's campaign against phoniness. Here's how it happened. I have to tell you about how the first thoughts of killing John Lennon came to my mind. I would go to the library. That was my one peaceful oasis. When I came across the Anthony Fawcett book, John Lennon, One Day at a Time, I pulled that book out of the shelf. And I looked at it, and I began looking through the pictures. And I began judging John Lennon by photographs. I, I learned from the book that he was from the Dakota, which is this very exclusive uh, co-op in Manhattan, and, and that angered me. I why? got very, very angry. Well, why? I used to love the Beatles and, and go along with anything they said. Their idealism meant a lot to me. And I saw that at that time as a sellout. I was just letting loose this tirade of, you know, just an explosive anger at John Lennon. Rich man, rich yes. apartment. Yes, that's it sell out. Later at home, Mark remembers pulling out the album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It was 1979, and although the album was now 12 years old, this photograph of Lennon in an expensive satin uniform confirmed for Mark that Lennon had betrayed the idealism of the 60s. Chapman was enraged. In reality, 1979 found Lennon far removed from the public eye. Would you give it all up to run away and join the circus? Uh, I've already given it up. I haven't decided where to run, though. <laughs> His world now revolved around Yoko and their young son, Sean. But in Mark David Chapman's disturbed mind, the pieces were falling into place. He was caught in an unstoppable downward spiral. I'm becoming very, very closed in and very uh, dangerous. I'm becoming lost in my own world. And uh, I'm whipping around inside this thing. And I just kept sinking deeper and deeper and deeper. When we come back, December 8th, 1980, Mark David Chapman spent the day on the sidewalk outside the Dakota Apartments in New York City. It was there that he came face to face with John Lennon not once, but twice. Chapman recalls his horrifying crime right after this. I really like Rice Krispie Treats. You can make them so really easy. I watch my mom. Yeah? First you want some marshmallow and margarine. Then you pour in a Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Then you come out of the kitchen and put your hand like this and say, I'm finally done. Then you can take it out to dinner. Kellogg's Rice Krispies treats. And this holiday, make a batch for whoever drops in.
Here comes the baby. Push so we can get the baby's head out. Give it a push now. A little more. A little more. Give it a push now. Yeah. Breathe through your nose. Good. Stay like that. Oh, it's a beautiful baby. Here we baby. go. I can't believe it. Look at that. Oh. It's a little girl. There's no better place to spend this holiday season than Chasey Penny. You'll find colorful wrapping, twinkling lights, and garlands of gold, shining faces, cozy get togethers, and a lot of excitement in the air. Best of all, our great values mean you'll have plenty of holiday greenery to go around. Which is why the best place to spend this holiday season is Chasey Penny. The Carlsons love Freedent because it won't stick to their dental work. But since trying new Winterfresh Freedent, things have really cooled off, particularly their breath. Because when your mouth feels cooler, your breath feels fresher. New Winterfresh Freedent. Share the joy of the holidays with movies from McDonald's. Take home the hilarious Dirty Rotten Scoundrels or the family favorite Babes in Toyland. Each video just $5.99 when you buy any large sandwich. What you want is what you get at McDonald's today. Saturday, one of college football's oldest traditions is followed by its newest. First, one of the great rivalries in sports, the Army-Navy game. Then the national title, bowl bids, and the conference crown are on the line as undefeated Alabama meets Florida in the SEC championship game presented by Dr. Pepper. It's all Saturday on ABC Sports. Saturday. Lieutenant Columbus, please. A love triangle, a deadly rendezvous. Oh. Mr. Evans was murdered. But Columbo's on the case. He's out of fact. Peter Falk stars. Uneasy lies the crown. Ah! Saturday. You got a tip? Now, to continue Barbara's interview with the man who killed John Lennon. An abusive father, low self-esteem, and depression. Are those factors that came together and exploded inside Mark David Chapman? And if it's simpler than that, that he was a madman, isn't it disturbing that no one close to him recognized the danger before it surfaced so violently? All I know is that there was great, great despair and emptiness of feeling king-sized nobody. And I see this real somebody who I perceived at the time to be a phony. My nobody was wanting to strike down that somebody. Mark bought a Charter Arms 38 pistol and a plane ticket for New York City. When he checked out of his job as a maintenance man for the last time, he signed John Lennon. In New York Central Park, Chapman recreated Holden Caulfield's weekend visit to New York from the book, The Catcher in the Rye, including a visit to the carousel in Central Park. He was becoming increasingly deranged, and he did a shocking thing. Before I killed John Lennon, I turned to Satan because I knew I wouldn't have the strength to kill a man on my own. So I went through what I thought was an appropriate satanic ritual, and took all my clothes off and chanted and screamed and howled and... Before the murder? Yes. I asked Satan to give me the power to kill John Lennon. Bring me back to December 8th, 1980. It was a very long day. It was overcast. And I had been uh, standing outside the Dakota for many hours, talking to the people that were there. All of a sudden, John Lennon comes out. Paul Gorish, an amateur photographer, Snap this picture of Chapman's first encounter with John Lennon. I bought Double Fantasy. You bought this album that was very popular at that time. Yes, it was. Paul kind of pushed me forward. He said, there he is, there he is. So I went up to him and I stuck out my album. And I, somehow I found the words and I said, 
John, would you sign my album? Where did he sign? Right on Yoko's neck. What did he write? He wrote John Lennon, 1980. And this is the toughest part to deal with, but he was very cordial to me. He wasn't phony. And he even asked me if I wanted anything else. So I always thought there was a premonition there or something that was hard. But when he did sign it, it was, it was a magical kind of a thing. I mean, here's John Lennon in the flesh, and he's signing my album. You know, there was always a struggle there. There wasn't just a, a murderer standing there, a potential murderer. There was a, there was a decent fellow standing there, too, who wanted to get the hell back to Hawaii and go back to his wife and say, look, look what I've got, and just forget about the whole thing. After it got dark, the hours went by, two, three, four hours, five hours. I had the gun in my pocket, and I had a copy of the catch in the rye over the gun. So I'm sitting there. It's dark, and this limo pulls up. The driver didn't get out, but Yoko opened the back door. She didn't wait for John. She walked past me. And John got out. And he came up the pathway. And he looked at me also. I heard this voice. Not an audible voice, but an inaudible voice saying over and over, do it, do it, do it, do it. I guess that was me inside. And I pulled the 38 revolver out of my pocket. I went into what's called a, a combat stance. I pulled the gun up. I used my left hand to buttress the gun underneath. And I fired at his back five steady shots. And at that point, for me, the movie stopped. I just stood there, just almost in a trance. The doorman, Jose, came over to me, and he had tears in his eyes. And he said, do you know what you've done? Do you know what you've done? And the tears are streaming down his face. And he grabbed my arm, my right arm, and he shook. I mean, this is a brave man who grabs the arm of a, an armed man who has just shot somebody and shakes it, and the gun fell down and clattered on the concrete, and he kicked it away. And he said, get out of here. He says, please. Please, just leave. Please get out of here. And I looked at him, and I said, but where would I go? I turned to, to my sec little security blanket, and I pulled out the catch in the rye, and I, and I opened it, I guess trying to read, because I was frightened to death. And they came. They arrested me. I put the book on top of my head. When they threw me against the wall of the archway, the book fell down to the concrete as they were leading me away in handcuffs. The, I, I, I noticed the book was gone, and I said, Officer, my book, my book, almost my lifeline. And the officer took up the book and put it in a plastic bag, and he put me in the back of the patrol car. There were two horrible things that happened. First, I mean, you can imagine the commotion. I mean, it was, it was surreal. Two officers were holding John Lennon's body. And I remember the look on the officer's face and what he was mouthing, although I couldn't hear him, the one that was holding his head and his shoulders. And he was just violently cursing me. Just, it was a horrible thing to see. And it, it frightened me to death. I, here's this police officer, and he's just mouthing these horrible 
uh, words at me. And I sat there for maybe another minute or so, and over in the corner of my eye, I see this figure come up to the window. It was Yoko Ono. She'd come over to the window of the patrol car, and she looked in, and I, and I looked at her, and I'm just, I'm devastated by her look. I mean, she just wanted to, you know, who's this horrible monster that has killed John Lennon, my husband, you know, and, and I want to see this rat, you know, I want to see this creep. And I'm looking at her, and I just, utterly ashamed, a big coward, I turn away, and I, I can't even face her. John Lennon died in the back of a squad car on the way to the hospital. He was 40 years old. Mark David Chapman was 25. After several months in preparation of an insanity defense, Mark's legal counsel was stunned when he suddenly insisted on pleading guilty because, he said, he realized he was. He was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. And so when I came here to Attica, I'm sitting in my cell and I'm having a tremendous problem with inner, inner chaos, inner friction, problems connecting thoughts, just, just horrible problems. And it really hit me. I felt like the Lord told me, that's your problem. You have demonic entities within you. You summon them, buddy. You asked for it, and now we're going to deal with that. That's where I was about five, six years ago. And then, Mark says, with a priest standing outside the prison walls, the demons were expelled during an exorcism. And this was real. And when these things came out of me, I could feel them. I could feel them when they came out of my mouth. They were different personalities, and there were different sounds and different languages. For many years, The Catcher in the Rye was your Bible. Do you still read The Catcher in the Rye? No. Do you in any way identify with Holden Caulfield? No. I don't even have a copy in my cell. Mark and Gloria Chapman will celebrate their 13th wedding anniversary this year. She still makes regular trips from Hawaii to visit. Mark will be eligible for parole in eight years. Please understand, Yoko, I wasn't killing a real person. I killed an image. I killed an album cover. There's enough pain in the world, and I caused it the Titanic's worth overnight. Just some stupid thing took away a genius, took away somebody's husband, somebody's father. I met his son that day, and I knew how far gone I was after I met his son, if I could still do something like that. I mean, he was five years old. I don't expect him to forgive me. I'm not asking that. I wouldn't even dare to ask that. But I am sorry, and I mean that. I am sorry. I'm sorry. And what is that worth? Barbara, is it conceivable that he would be paroled in eight years? That's mind-shattering. Well, it is up to parole board, but there are some things to consider. He's in an isolated section in this prison, in great part because it's feared that other prisoners might take his life to become famous themselves or out of hatred. Probably the safest place he could be is in prison. Now, do you imagine that any time in the future an enlightened society might be able to anticipate and prevent this kind of behavior without severely bending civil rights? This is a tough challenge. We talked to Chapman about this. He said he himself tried to get help, but he called some psychiatric counseling uh, places, but they put him off, and, and maybe it would have made a difference, but he was probably too far gone. He talks about people who do stalk celebrities, and he said, and I wrote this down, you don't want to end up like me. You don't want to end up this way. This is no good. This isn't celebrityism. This is garbage. The fact that my killing some type of celebrity would make me a celebrity, that didn't happen. It won't happen to you. That's what I would tell these people. Get help. Talk to somebody. Get counseling. One last thing. Do any of the prophets from this new biography of him go to Mark David Chapman? 
No, none of them. No. They go to the author of the book and to a license group at Attica who helps prisoners try to adjust to society uh, if they uh, are paroled. Thank you, Barbara. Next on the program, imagine working for years to buy your own home and then losing it in a 